So it's continental then? Mm hmm Very good. Well, we have brought the GT out to the local coffee and donut shop. And I guess I need to explain how I've waited 30 years for a motorcycle that didn't exist 30 years ago. And this comes down to my, uh, my relationship with Royal Enfield. Because it didn't start with me wanting to buy like the Himalayan or anything like that. It started in like 19, mid 90s. Uh, there was a German company called MZ that made sport bikes, uh, dual sports, standards, things like that. But they all used a 660cc Yamaha engine, it's a single cylinder. Uh, and these bikes were overlooked a lot because they were very low powered in relation to other bikes. So a 600cc sport bike in the mid 90s, you know, made close to 100 horsepower. And now you've got a 600cc sport bike from Germany that only made like 48 to 50, so roughly half. And so it, they didn't go over well because people would look at me like, why would I pay that for a bike that's half as powerful as one of these Japanese bikes? And I, was, I wasn't one of them that said that, but I never bought one because I didn't really want a sport bike, but I understood the concept of a low-powered sporty bike because you could get out there and just flog the snot out of one of those things and have a blast as opposed to, you know, trying to take everything, just, you know, just serious, just hard-edged performance. And I, I kind of wish they would have made like a uh, retro style cafe bike, but they didn't. And so that kind of got me on the path of making my own cafe style, low powered sporty bike. So I started looking at like older British bikes and things like that, you know, what to use as my base for doing so and at that time you know triumph was coming back but like norton you know and things like that were long gone and you just wasn't getting one or if you did it was a basket case or something somebody restored and then you don't want to you don't want to bastardize that type of bike turning it into something else so i got turned on to a company called royal enfield that was from india who were still actually making the 1955 bullet over there and they were starting to export them. And so I was like, oh, that's great. Cause I mean, they were only like three grand. I was like, I could get a brand new bike. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not worried about bastardizing anything like that. And I can just customize it how I want. And so I was really interested in the bike until I started hearing that they really weren't that good and they weren't. And so I never bought the Bullet either because there were just too many things that did go wrong with those bikes. Not just potential problems, but there were really problems. Because they existed for a long time in kind of a protective environment. And they were made 
to a, a standard as a workhorse machine, a tool that people used every day, as opposed to the Western market where we tend to buy bikes as luxury items and not as our daily transportation. That's you know market wide. I'm not saying everybody is that way. So I really, I wanted to buy one. I liked it. Um, it's kind of like me in the Alfa Romeo GTV6. I love that car. I think it's an awesome car, but it's a total piece of crap. So I, I'm not buying one. And so I was the same way about the bullet. I figured I, and, and there was rumors about improvements that were going to be made and they were going to build new factories and things like that. And there was a lot of like corporate changes coming, things like that, because they were trying to expand into the Western market and they needed to step up their game in order to do so. So I just kept watching. And they did make slow improvements here and there and even came out with the uh, Bullet Clubman, which I absolutely loved. I was like, oh, there we go. There's my sporty cafe style bike right up my alley. But the engine just wasn't there. Uh, even the UCE engine, I, I wasn't thrilled with that. So like the Continental uh, 535, I, I wasn't interested in that one because they hadn't stepped up that engine enough, you know, for me to pique my interest, really. So it wasn't until they brought out the Himalayan that I started going, okay, is this really going to be a good bike now? Are they really stepping it up? So uh, my purchase of the Himalayan wasn't really f because I was dead set on buying an adventure bike and I had to have the Himalayan. It was more of a test of a couple of things. One, I wanted to see if Royal Enfield could actually make a good bike. And two, did I want an adventure bike? And so that was, that was the reason, rationale behind me buying the Himalayan. And from what I saw, for the most part, Royal Enfield really did step it up. You could see a quality difference between the Bullet era and, you know, the Himalayan. Uh, the engine was great. I, I never had any problems with it. The only problem I ever had on that bike was uh, I broke a clutch cable. That was it. And then they introduced the 650s, and they were new at the time that I bought the Himalayan. So they were still kind of unproven and just uh, nobody had really, you know, sussed things out as to how good that engine was yet at that time. And then they came out with the 350s. And you can actually see a, a quality step up from the 500s, you know, the bullet era to the Himalayan. It steps up a bit to the 650s, it steps up even more. And then the 350s, I mean, they really refined that 350 down quite a bit. So now that the, the, three, the 650s have been out long enough for me to say, okay, now I'll buy one. So I'm not an early adopter. I'm not gonna run out and just buy something because it's new. I'm not, this year's model, yeah, I gotta have it. No, don't care. I wanna let something come onto the market and see how it performs and how it holds up and identify what are the trouble areas, if there are any. And the 650 has proven itself worthy, in my opinion, enough for me to purchase one. So I'm going to finish my coffee and my donut. We're going to take another ride and go somewhere else. And when it comes to this bike versus the Himalayan, uh, it makes almost no sense, really. The Himalayan is way more practical. The only advantage this really has is, you know, the styling and looks and some power, and that's about it. But as far as the character and styling of this bike goes, I don't have to make any assumptions. This thing garners an unusual amount of praise and attention everywhere it goes so far. I didn't even make it home the first day I bought it without being stopped three times, people asking me about the bike. Power and performance wise, it's got a 0 to 60 time and I don't care and a top speed of who gives a shit. That's not what this bike's about. When it comes to the power, the handling, the lighting, things like that, it's adequate. That's about the best way I can describe it. it it's got enough, enough that it needs, not much else. 
it's just a pure visceral experience riding this bike. And like I said, even though it kind of makes no sense, I'm drawn to it like a moth to a flame. And it's a pretty no frills bike. It's got everything you need on it, but not necessarily everything you want, if that makes any sense. So there's no gear indicator. There's no clock on the dash, but it's got the odometers and things like that, the stuff you need, not necessarily all the things you might want out of a bike. The fit and finish, uh, even though it's vastly improved over, you know, things like the Bullet 500, you know, era, it's still, it, it's, it's kind of lacking. And I, I don't want to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, because this bike is marketed more towards the masses, the everyday man, not somebody who's going out to pay for, like, billet triple trees and things like that. This has got a cast triple tree. It's what you need. Might not be what you want. It's what you need. So it's kind of built with that mindset in mind. The stock seat wasn't great in my opinion, so I replaced it with the premium touring seat. They look almost identical except for the red stitching on the, on the touring seat, but the stock seat, the foam just seemed to give up way too early and it caused uh, Big Jim and the twins to go comfortably numb. Trying to take a pee when your junk's, you can't feel your junk. The seating position, it's aggressive, but not overly so. So if I hop on the bike, put my feet up on the, on the rear set, so you can see my riding position. I can scoot up, sit almost bolt upright, or I can scoot back and get more aggressive with it if I want to. Now the wheels are spoked and tubed, and I'm okay with that. Because I'm about an hour from the nearest motorcycle dealer in any direction, so to get a tire changed is a major undertaking. And with these, I can do it all myself at home. So I want to be able to do the mounting, balancing, all that myself. In fact, I removed the longer rear mudguard just to make it easier to get the rear tire in and out as opposed to making it look sporty. Then they're both 18 inch wheels. That means I only got to carry one, one size of spare inner tube, which I'm digging that. Maintenance is another area where I'm really digging what they've done here. It's actually pretty easy to get to the valves it's not too difficult to take the tank off. It's uh, two bolts, two hoses, an electrical plug, an electrical plug, and a connection up front. That's all it takes to get it off there. Even though there are eight valves, they're easy to get to. And so that makes things really nice. Plus oil changes. There's your oil filter right there. Your drain plug is right beneath it. That's it. There's no faffing about like the Himalayan and the, uh, the 350s, the Classic and the Meteor. They're a bit of a faff compared to this. I wish they would have learned uh, lessons from this one and carried it forward with the, like the Meteor or, or the 350 models, put it that way. The Himalayan, I can give them a pass on that one being a learning experience, but I think this is where they, the direction they need to be going as far as maintenance is concerned. Now, problem areas to keep an eye on on this bike is your battery, your electrical relays, which are here, and a rectifier regulator, which is up underneath the back side of the engine. When it comes to addressing any potential problems, first thing you should do is pull the relays, which are behind here, there's four of them. Clean the plugs out because they'll be packed with a white lithium type grease and replace the plugs or replace the, the relays themselves. They're anywhere from five to 10 bucks. You can get some good ones from like Hitchcock's or even Bosch. Uh, next is your battery. These are really susceptible to batteries that are starting to go bad because your headlight draws a ton of electricity off your battery and you'll turn, you'll, you'll go to start the bike, headlight will come on, you'll hit the starter and it's not, it doesn't have enough juice to turn over the starter. And you can tell if that's your problem by removing the seat and pulling out your headlight fuse and then trying to start the bike. And the bike starts, put your fuse in, get home you know you're about due for a new battery. Another issue is the battery not being charged from the bike. So if, you, if you're out riding and you stop, take a rest or whatever like that, and then get on your bike and suddenly it just won't act like the battery's dead, it might be dead because it's not getting a charge. And that comes from back here, there is what's known as the rectifier regulator, and that part is known to go bad from just engine heat and things like that. So electron electronics just don't like heat. I've seen people working on moving that to a different location. In fact, I might take out the 
the smog components underneath back here that you don't need and see if I can't move it around or something like that in the future. I might try that. Other than that, I haven't seen any problems with like the actual engine or anything like that going bad. It's just little connections and things like that that seem to be causing, you know, gremlins here and there. As far as accessories and things that I've done to this bike, um, I have changed the tank and made it the chrome and black version versus the black and gold, what was it called, black magic scheme that it originally came with. And I just think it looks better from the cockpit view looking down at this as opposed to just two gold stripes going across this way. I thought the, the black magic looked good from the side. I just didn't like it from the cockpit looking down at it. I uh, put on bar end mirrors. These are stadium mirrors from Hitchcock's. Quad lock mounted to the front brake clamp. I've got a dual USB charger installed. Cap stands from Motone. Uh, that allows me to strap a bag to the seat and gives me an anchor point. And I've put on the center stand, which any bike with tube tires gets a center stand in my book. And the SNS pipes were on it when I got it. I bought the bike second, or I was acquired the bike second hand. So those were there when I already got the bike. And I believe that's it, other than like maintenance things. Like I put the DNA filter in it and things like that just for maintenance purposes, change the relays. Other than that, it's all stopped. I'm not gonna do any performance upgrades, anything like that. I think it's just fine the way it is. If I do any more upgrades, I might replace the fenders with stainless steel units, debating on that. Um, I think they'd look kind of cool, striped like the tank. I think that would give it a good look. And side luggage, I haven't decided yet. I wanna see how, how these work out with a, you know, a nice tail bag before I decide to mount saddlebag stays or anything like that, that will kind of clutter up this area. I kind of want to leave it as clean as I can. So hopefully this tail bag works out really well and I don't have to resort to that. So the bottom line is, after 30 years of waiting for this bike, I absolutely adore it. In fact, I want to spend the rest of my life riding this. Take care and I'll catch you guys next time.